Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIM Podcast. Women in Influencer Marketing is a first-of-its-kind exclusive networking group made up of inspirational women. This podcast is where we explore influencer marketing and get real about women in business. Find us wherever you download podcasts, and of course, you can always find us at IamWim.com. That's IamWim, double I, dot com. Hey guys, what's going on? Um, I am super happy to be here today. I'm like, I'm feeling good. It's like summer here, finally in New York. We get like, <laughs> we get like a week or two of spring. It's a, it's a myth. We don't actually get a spring, but it's summer and we're in the backyard and we're getting our new house together. We have this beautiful pool so after like installing a heater and a getting the gas hooked up and the electric hooked up, we're um, we're almost there. I'm excited to like invite people over to the house, which I've never done before. I'm a city girl through and through, so I'm so used to having like a shoebox of an apartment in Manhattan. And although I cried my eyes out the day that I left the city during the pandemic because it made no sense for me to be there anymore. I am so blessed to have found our dream home here in Brooklyn. <laughs> so we're sur- we're still very close to the city, um, but I never thought that I would be living this life. So I'm just really happy, really happy, really happy, period. Um, I'm really excited to chat with you guys today. Uh, Our guest is Joanna Voss. Um, She's a talent manager who we've known for a few years now, and she is such a powerhouse. I am obviously partial towards telling the stories of talent managers, especially those who I think are doing exceptional work, like better work than some others who I I don't think are doing the best work, to be completely frank with you. And um, Joanna is just absolutely one of those people who um, has just been running her business in her own lane, doing her own thing, killing it. And I think we have so much to learn from her. So um, if you are intrigued by this episode and everything that Johanna says really like resonates with you, she taught a masterclass for our community, which I will link in the show notes so that you can learn more from her. And um, and she taught so many really great tips and tricks for talent managers in that masterclass. But as for today and a little bit about her, so she's trusted by social media influencers who want clarity on how to build their brands, grow their businesses, earn their worth, and plan strategically for the future. Um, she's closed close to $3.5 million in brand deals, partnerships, and speaking engagements. Her clients have partnered with brands such as Walmart, AARP, Kroger, H&R Block, Aldi, and AARP stands out to me, which I think is really special, that she's all about representing influencers who are diverse. And uh, a lot of her clients are fellow Latinas, but also she represents somebody who's a little bit older, could post about ARP, for example. She represents um, a lot of different diversities from ethnic diversity, age diversity, and, and a lot more. So I love that piece of her business. I think it's very special. And um, prior to her work in the talent manager space, I love this, she actually worked on the presidential campaigns of Hillary Clinton, John Kerry for more than seven years. Um, She's a world traveler. She lived in Spain three times, and she can often be found cycling Colorado's mountain ranges. Anyways, I'm so excited for you to learn more from Johanna. I will link all of her social channels, ways to get in touch with her in the show notes, her previous masterclass in the show notes. And also if you want to meet more incredible women just like her, I will also link to how to join our membership community as well. That's IamWim.com slash join. I look forward to you enjoying this episode. And um, without further ado, let's get into it. I am super excited to welcome 
a really great guest today. She is a talent manager. She's been one for a long time with incredible clients. She is a longtime member of WIM and gives to our community mm -hmm. so much that I, I just sit back and I'm like, dang, like our other members are so lucky because you mm -hmm. contribute, you share, you're like a girl's girl, you know, like you are all about just supporting other women. Um, we were just talking about, I was like, oh, one of our other members like shared one of your posts on social media yesterday mm -hmm. and I happened to notice it. And um, I, I just, I love seeing the relationships that you've formed in WIM. So with all Thank that you. being said, this is Joanna. So hi, good morning. Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Life is fantastic. And I mean, you know, I love always jamming out on all things influencer marketing, especially as related to talent management. So appreciate the invite and excited to be here. I'm super, super excited <laughs> to have you. And we were talking before, just before we started recording. And I was like, I usually tell people right before we come on, like, okay, like, please be, you know, open, honest, candid, you know, the cat, like the tone of our podcast tends to be casual and like, I was like, I don't really need to share any of that with you because I feel like that's who you naturally are. And that's one of the many reasons I was excited to have you on today. I love that you are an incredibly successful solopreneur. Um, I think that you run your business somewhat differently than some other talent managers. So I'm excited to have our, our, our community hear about some of those distinctions. Um, I, I'm excited to hear... A little bit how you approach management differently in terms of even the talent you you represent and focus on. Um, so before we sort of dive into all of those topics and probably many more, I want to hear a little bit more just about like the mission of your work, a little bit of like the why you do what you do. Yes. So such a good question. It's funny. Every time I see it, it always just has me thinking like, what is my mission? Like, how am I making sure I'm staying connected and true to it? Had you asked me a little while ago, it would have been, you know, helping women as a talent manager earn the most, help them grow their business and build their business. And now I realize there is a deeper, greater level and commitment to Yes, helping women, helping my clients earn money, earn their worth, earn their value, but also building up the confidence and building up the muscle of negotiation and worth and value and having that understanding um, intrinsically, intrinsically to it. And granted, I'm the mouthpiece for them, but just what they see me ask for, what they see me get. It's like, I see when I tell them, there's always this like, oh, they're paying me that? Like there's, there's still those moments and I'm like, that's what this is all about is because that confidence and, and their marriage to their value and worth rolls over into other areas of their life, you know, infiltrates the conversations with their girlfriends. So that's what I'm all about is helping women earn their worth, earn their value. And of course, not leaving any, not leaving any money on the table when it comes to negotiation. I love that. I mean, negotiations, like what a fun topic, right? And I feel like if you are working in talent management, the ideal is that like you love negotiations. It's like a oh, yeah. game, you're advocating for people, you're making them money. But like it's, I, I don't know, I'd love to hear because in my opinion, negotiating is so much more than just about the money. There are so oh, many things that play in terms of things that you can negotiate for, so what are some of those things? Like, what are some of the like moving parts that, that you're exploring all the time in terms of your negotiations? Well, as you said, there's always the money, which I think is what people always think about when it comes to negotiation. And there's so many other elements, right? We know that we get a project opportunity, figure out the scope, get the budget, say yes. And then you get the agreement. And you're like, oh my God, there's the usage, there's exclusivity, there's licensing, there's ownership, there's payment terms, there's timing of the project. Wow, they never told me they wanted it in a week. And now the agreement says I have to turn in content in like five business days. Um, so there's that negotiation. There's all those other things. It's like a perpetual choose your own adventure. Um, you are negotiating creative freedom. You are negotiating how many rounds of edits. You're negotiating what the brand is able to edit. I always include language that says not to alter the influencer's voice. Um, you are negotiating how much of the messaging 
you know, this five page brief that the brand sends over, what's the, what are the priority points? What does the content creator really have to pull and include? Because they're obviously not going to include all five pages of content and you want to make sure that it's in their own voice. So you're negotiating like what's the balance between messaging and creative freedom in the voice of the content creator. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing too, is just how the brand can use the content so that usage has its own, like its own other follow your own adventure path of different ways that can go in terms of paid social, digital, all media, print, pamphlets, billboards. Can there be derivatives of the work for video or voice, um, you know, voice projects? Can it be on all of the brand's channels or just social? Or if they have other families of channels, can it be on that or just this one that's like the brand partner? Um, I, I love negotiation. I, um, I, I mean, you kind of said it like it's, it's, it's sort of a game not to like diminish how important it is and how seriously I take it. But I think when you're able to have fun with it and not be so grippy and attached, it's like, which I understand, you know, you're starting as an influencer and you get a project opportunity to come in and then people are like, Oh my God, like, do I say yes? What do I tell them about rate? And it's like, I can feel that stress, like that people have that desperation of like, I have to say the right answer or I'm going to ruin this for the rest of my life. No brand will ever say yes. This brand will never reach out to me. This agency will never reach out to me. And I'm always trying to tell people like, relax, like literally have fun. Like the fact that they reached out to you, you're on their radar. They want to work with you. If you are getting down and having a couple different conversations about um, scope of work and budget and like you're starting to get deep into the conversation and then you get to the final thing and you change your mind, you still want to negotiate. It's like, you can still do that. They're not going to be like, well, we just spent a month with you. We're now, because if you pull out, then they're like back to zero with somebody else and starting new with someone else. So I think the more that you can have fun with it and practice outside of these higher pressure, like brand partnership situations so that when you come into it, you're like, I can ask for $20,000. I can ask for $100,000. I can ask for $150,000 and no exclusivity, like things that you're like, oh my God, this is crazy. When you flex that muscle outside of this situation, I think that's what really helps you get better at it, build your confidence. It's not so unfamiliar when you go into it and you've had some places to try it and succeed where there's like no risk, you know, going out to bars and being like, I'm constantly like, oh, I'm here with a friend out of town. This is like my favorite bar. I made him come to this bar. Like, can we get a free round of drinks? Or can we get apps on the house? Are we going to get 10% off? Whatever. I don't care if they do it or not, but I'm just asking literally just to like keep practicing. And it's fun because you never know like who you're going to meet, what's going to happen, how things are going to unfold. Like maybe you spark up a really neat conversation. The people next to you are like, oh my God, we're from out of town too. And like, we, I don't know. Like I'm just, I love the doors that negotiation offers. And I think the more fun you have with it, A, the more successful you'll be. And of course, just the more fun you'll have with it, which if you're doing this every single day, um, I like having fun all the time and, um, yeah, it wouldn't work for me if this was like super stressful and just kind of like not a good time. Wait, I love that so much. So Johanna's telling you to go to your favorite bar with a group of friends and negotiate with the restaurant. And look, I, I think this is such good advice for so many reasons. First of all, life is a negotiation. You're negotiating with your partner or your kids, if you've got kids, your colleagues, your parents, everybody, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. The more that you can practice in a variety of different ways and aspects in your life, you're flexing that muscle, like you said. And it is, a lot of it is about confidence. You know, influencers themselves, like I have found in my experience, like they struggle a bit to negotiate for themselves, which makes sense though. Doesn't that make sense? That's why they have managers. I consider myself an incredible negotiator for other people. When I'm negotiating for myself, I struggle. I do. What about you? Do you find that like, I, I sense a confidence in terms of your negotiation skills, your comfort, your fun, whatever. How about negotiating for yourself? Do you, do you feel as confident? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but it's taken me a long time to get there. It's definitely taken me a long time to get there. Did not come easy. And it has been because of this work and it spills over in other areas of my life. And, you know, there are moments when I'm having to negotiate things for myself and I'm like, come on, Joanna. I'm like, you know this, like, you know better than that. Or like, if I find my brain thinking, you know, kind of like, oh, I just like, oh, do I do it? I feel so bad. I'm just like, nope, nope, stop it, stop it. And I will just like snap out of it and 
do it well for myself. But yeah, it took, it took a long time. Um, and to your point earlier, like it drives me nuts when women are like, oh, we're so bad at negotiation. I'm like, that's total BS. Exactly what you just said. Like we're, I mean, think about negotiating with your kids for, if you have kids, negotiating with, you know, your toddler about bedtime or bath time or like an extra snack or an extra dessert. Or do you have a piece of chocolate or a snack like before dinner? Can they watch an extra 15 minutes of like their favorite show? Like you're constantly negotiating or negotiating with your partner about where you want to go for dinner or vacation or a big like spend like a big budget spend that you want to do that they don't want to do. Um, you know, with your parents about things, you really want them to like hire someone to help them with something in their house as they are getting older and they really won't. So like we're constantly negotiating and we're really good at it. So I understand that people may not be good as good at it in this space. It's totally personal. Like literally it is your face and your brand, but I really want people to stop. I really want women to stop saying that they're bad at negotiation because that is, a hundred percent not true. And you're, and by simply saying that you're bad at negotiating or anything, you're like immediately cutting yourself off from yeah. like, from exploring it, from, from being good at it. So like, why are you going to shoot yourself in the foot um, by doing that? So, so here's a question. So I've heard you say like, okay, so like to get better at negotiating, or if you feel as if you're not good at it, negotiate in it, all aspects of your life. I think that's fantastic. Um, I would even say a tip that I would give is like to just like to put yourself out there in as many situations as possible um, and know that like if you don't get the result you want, um, ask more questions because yes. I think that a lot of negotiating is really asking more questions to figure out what the other side wants, what the other side needs and what they deem valuable because don't make any assumptions. What you think they want or what you even think is valuable to them might not be the case at all. So isn't that a great and easy way to give something if like, they're like, oh my God, I would die to be posted on your Instagram. And you're like, that's such an easy gift for us. Don't tell them that, but be like, okay, yeah, we can throw that in, blah, right. blah, blah, to sweeten the deal. What, like, so listening, asking questions, figuring out what they feel is valuable to them. Are there any other tips or tricks that you would give people who are struggling to negotiate ways to negotiate better? What would you, what would mm -hmm. you say? I would say adding onto your questions at 110%. It is such an easy way to ease into negotiations because you're right. There's way more information out there that would be really helpful for you to know, for them to know about you. And if you have questions that you ask, it, it, it's not like, okay, what's your budget? And you're like, oh, do I say the right thing? Like, oh my gosh, am I going to make it or break it? But instead you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Thanks so much for reaching out to me. How'd you hear about me? I'm so curious. I'm on your, I'm on your radar. Like, I'd love to know more how I got on your agency's radar. What are the expectations of this project? I'd love to learn more about the goals of this project. Some really high level, um, not so in the weeds, personal stuff. You know, what are your, what are your expectations of me, of this project, of this campaign? Like, those are fantastic questions to ask always um, because they're nice kind of like big bucket broad questions. And then they could say, oh, well, the, the brand is launching a new blah, 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 blah in the stores. And we really want to just like promote awareness. We're doing a media blitz. Um, we're trying for app downloads to get to 10,000 by the end of the month. And maybe you're not good at converting. So you're like, actually, I'm going to bow out because like that's not my strong suit. Um, or maybe you're like, oh, I killed on conversions. Like, this is my jam. I'm going to go above and beyond. Like, let me just tell you how I could do this. It'll be stories. It'll be a TikTok. Da, 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 da. Like, I've already done this campaign and I know how it works. Or maybe they're like, we're just trying to get some, you know, educational awareness. We're breaking into a new market. We're looking for people, you know, that influencers that are local to a certain area, um, which side note always cracks me up because it's the internet. So there is no geographic boundary, but I get it. Like, especially in the food space. Um, the expectations question, yeah, goals, like how did you learn about me? What else should I know about this campaign? Like what else should I know about this project? Again, those are just like neutral. You're putting the ball back in their court and you're going to get a ton of information, which will then help you actually quote the project much better. So you're not getting into that negotiation because you're just in like the question asking phase. Negotiation is when you're like, I want X for X. And they're like, no, we want to offer Y for Z. And you're like, I'm going to give you A for D. That's the part that's like a little tricky, but if you're asking, or can be tricky, but if you're asking all those big questions, you're literally just like chatting, 
hey, do you have 10 minutes? I'd love to just like hop on the phone. Can you tell me more about this project? You know, what the, what's the timeline? What's the timing of it? You're getting tons of information so that you can actually quote properly. And that way, when you give a number, I think it also helps you understand, well, this is my number. And here's why you're looking for a quick turnaround. You're looking for, you know, images, licensing here, advertising, paid usage here, this, that, and the other. Um, it's just, it's super, super helpful. And if for someone who is open to negotiation, they're like, okay, Joanna, I hear you. I'm going to try this in non-business brand settings. I'm going to like go to my local bar, restaurant, or like this, you know, maybe it's a place you love shopping. You're like, I literally spend a thousand dollars, five hundred dollars every month. Like, can I have a ten percent off discount code? Or like, I'd love to share this with my followers. Just like ask for stuff like that. Um, for someone who is like really open to giving it a whirl, go completely on the other side of like the extreme. Let me give you an example. I went to buy a new mattress. I love the story. If you've been around me, you've heard it before. But I will say it again because it completely drives home like such a great point. I was buying a mattress a couple years ago, you know, those big warehouse things. It was like one old dude in a back corner, clearly hadn't seen anybody else. So like in to buy a mattress thing, it was like mattress firm or something. And I needed a mattress. And I needed a mattress quickly because my parents are coming to visit in like a couple days. So I had to walk out of there with a mattress, which he didn't know. You know, I'm laying around, laying on all the mattresses, whatever, walking around. And then I purposely laid on one facing away from him because he of course was following me like an attached salesman just like telling me all these bits of information about the mattresses that I didn't need to know he was not reading the room but it doesn't matter I'm like okay this guy wants to sell a mattress so I lay in the mattress facing away from him and for argument's sake let's say the mattress was like 600 bucks and I'm like all right well how much how much can you do this mattress for or like how much can you give me for this mattress and I was like $200. Like, and I said it jokingly, like laughingly to kind of, if it didn't work, I could play it off as a joke. I was like, oh, haha, -ha. give it to me for, you know, 200 bucks. He's like, well, I can't do 200. And in that moment, I was joking. I was 100% joking. I was fully prepared to pay 600 or whatever it was. And in that moment, I was like, oh, okay. He's open for less than $600. We kind of went back and forth. And again, I wasn't facing him. So he couldn't like see me trying not to laugh because to me it was a joke and I ended up getting the mattress for like less than half the price I almost got free shipping or free delivery but I needed it before they were able to schedule it so I had to like go pick it up but yeah I didn't stop there I got the mattress for whatever less than 50 percent and then I was like what about free delivery can you throw in free delivery like I don't live that far I was like oh can I please have free delivery that part didn't work but just keep asking for stuff and you know, if I'd said like, oh, can you give it to me for a hundred bucks? And he was like, are you kidding? I'm like, oh, I'm totally kidding. Of course I'm kidding. Who would give a mattress for a hundred dollars? Like you can't just play it off. That's what I would say for someone who is open to like really leaning into it. Kind of just like go to the extreme other side and just like literally kind of pass it off as a joke and then see what lands. Cause someone may do exactly that in your situation. Like, oh, I can't give you 10% off, but like how about a coupon for a free entree next time you come to the restaurant? You're like, oh, Sweet. That works. Well, that's interesting because you also, I hear what you're describing is like leaving room for, for negotiation, right? Like if you throw out your exact ask, they're probably going to come back with something in the middle. And if you haven't left room for something right. in the middle, then you're kind of like, you're kind of in, in a bad situation. Like, and you're not in the best situation. Um, so I love that. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, if you become a good negotiator in work or in life, it's going to help you on the other side, right? It is interesting. It's very much a muscle that you flex. I want to pivot slightly to talk about pricing mm. for a lot of reasons. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Right? right. Okay. Let's do it. So in our Facebook group, I don't know if you've like been in there the past couple of days, you're mm -hmm. in there often a lot of talk about pricing in particular, um, how influencers are essentially like outpricing themselves. I saw a post in there about how, you know, they were negotiating back and forth in terms of price. And like at the very last minute, they said, I'm going to increase my prices yeah. actually. Like, you know, it's now, let's say like, a third more, 25% more, whatever it was, but like significantly more. A lot of the 
strong opinions mm-hmm. about both of these topics. I guess like just to start in terms of pricing, mm. what is your philosophy if you have one just about like how you price and, and maybe pushback that you get? Um, let's dive into mm. it. I did see that post. I, I, yes, I did see the post and I was actually talking about that exact post and this legit concern that agencies and brands have about absurd pricing because it does seem to be a little bit through the roof and doing a disservice to those of us that I think are doing it full time and, uh, are, you know, this is like their full-time content creation business. So pricing, all my clients have prices. Like we have an a la carte thing. Um, I have a Google doc for every single client. It is super basic. Everyone knows not to put, uh, rates on your media kit. So I have Google Doc of like all the different deliverables they would do. And when a brand reaches out, do I want to get the most amount of money for my clients? Of course, because then I make 20% of the most amount of money. So I'm very excited about that. Very motivated by money. So like I'm always asking for more for them because it also puts more in my pocket. We have our list of deliverables with rates. And I usually work with that. I don't go crazy high because I don't want to burn bridges. And a lot of times these are people that I've worked closely with and I know they trust me and I know like they will often say, wow, thanks so much for like your trans, because they'll say like, if we come in super over their budget it happened earlier this week, they're like, Hey, can you give us some transparency and how you got to that number? I'm like, yep. Do, 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 do. If you pull that number out of your ear with no basis on like, this is how much my photographer costs. This is my video team. Like here are all the things I need to count account for, for expenses. Here's my hourly rate. You know, here's my engagement. Here's my conversions. Like, here's what I'm seeing for our stories or reels, traction, like whatever it may be. If you can't back that up, then like you're kind of screwed. So I always, I always have my number. So, so can we, can we yeah. actually even pause there? Cause yeah. I want to dig into that a little bit. So like, how do you come up with those numbers? Is it a range? Is it based on like historical payments and deals that you've closed historically? Like, it is does it does that number fluctuate based yeah. on how busy they are time yeah. of year like yes. how do you come up with those yes. numbers so how do we come up with these numbers so when i started working with every single one of my clients they have already been in this industry and in they've already been making money and like had their business before i came in the picture and in some cases with them like long before i came in the picture so they already had an idea of some sort of rates. And I knew just by nature of what we were saying earlier, like you're never going to ask for the most for yourself that it was like, okay, these numbers are low. Or if you just do the math and like, how much do you want to make? What are your expenses? And you kind of just backwards into like how many projects you have to do, or will you want to charge X amount per Instagram reel just to kind of like make the math work. So I took the numbers that they came to me with, and I just started bumping them up for math's sake. Let's say they were like, I don't know, 2,500 for an in-feed post. I'd be like, okay, well, let me ask for 2,700. I get that a couple times. Let me ask for 3,000. Maybe I get that once or twice. So like I'll ask for 3K, but maybe I'm like, well, the client is open to doing it anywhere from like 2,500 to 3,000. And then you start getting yeses at that number and you kind of just like bump up a little bit. You also take into account all the other elements of exclusivity and usage and ownership and timing and turnaround. When I have clients that are deep in the throat of a lot of projects or a lot of travel and their window of time to create content is small and I'm very key on making sure they have rest and downtime between, between projects, yeah, that rate goes up a little bit. If, if the brand is super set on their timing, they're like, no, we really need it like a quick turnaround and we really need it within a week and you still have to get an agreement. They, the client still has to, like my client would still have to buy the product figure out what they're going to do, maybe send concepts for approval, get it approved. Like there's a lot happening. There is an extra added little inconvenience tax, if you will, or rush, whatever you want to call it added because if the client says no, it's like, if the brand says no, that's kind of like, that's okay. But if they say yes, it's like, well, this is bonus. This is a bonus project and you're getting paid extra for your, the inconvenience on your time and like the stress it may have. The numbers are dynamic. They definitely change. We do not, do we sign of like, oh, it's a new year bump up a little bit? Sure. A lot of times it's because their other um, like team members, like videographer, 
photographer, editor, like a lot of times January 1, they will get messages from those people to be like, okay, my rates have gone up. So like now it costs my client more to produce that same piece of content. Um, yeah, there's probably more I can say, but I think I'm just going to pause right there. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's really helpful because I also think it's important for both managers to sort of understand how you come up with rates, how they mm -hmm. fluctuate, how they're dynamic, like you said, mm -hmm. for brands to sort of understand. Um, I think from a brand perspective, um, certainly an agency perspective, there is a huge emphasis on pricing based on metrics mm -hmm. and performance mm -hmm. um, from these are broad generalizations and from a management perspective or an influencer perspective, it's a lot about, you know, an it factor. Um, oh, but like I, I'm perfect to talk about this brand or like, I love this brand. It's like, but like, does that convert to anything necessarily? Mm -hmm. Perhaps, but not necessarily. So I guess I'd, I'd love to hear from you in terms of the metrics piece and the conversions mm -hmm. piece and, you know, people asking, you know, or you, let's say you quote a price and someone asks you also for backend analytics base to get a sense of their, their engagement rate and things like that. And they're like, these don't match up. What would be your response to them? I would ask them what flexibility they have with the budget. And then sometimes it's just a miss and it's fine. We will walk away if they're like, oh, we're expecting, like the other day, someone's like, oh, sorry, we won't partner because we were looking for like 100,000 story views. And I was kind of like, what? Like, that's a lot. At least in my world and my clients, like you see their numbers. I don't know what people have to do to get story views, but all I hear about is it's reels. Seeing that to be true with my clients in terms of like, where are they getting traction and engagement? <laughs> we'll just walk and that's fine. My, they're, most of the time my clients don't even know because it's come to me and I haven't even like gotten to the stage of involving them yet. Um, but I will just ask if there's budget flexibility or, you know, sometimes they may say, oh, we can't do 5,000, but we've got 3,500. I'm like, okay, cool. Let me go ask my client and we'll, I'll take it back to them. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, let's make this work. Like I asked big and this is what they came in at. Let's do it. Or they may be like, oh, it's $300. And I'm like, okay, well, they will literally lose money between me, their photographer, their editor, the nanny that they have to have to watch their kids on photo shoot day. So it's like, yeah, that's a no. Or, you know, it's just like not a project they're excited about. Um, I do constantly have in my mind the dialogue between influencers who do their rates based on things, a certain set of things, and then brands and agencies that are like, well, what's the KP, like, what are, what are the, um, what do you call it? Like CPMs, right? Like, like very stuck for lack of a better word, but like, like using a certain framework and everything has to kind of like fit into that framework, into that puzzle piece. It doesn't always, it's a lot more nuanced. This is a lot more qualitative sometimes. Um, my clients are not the clients you hire to do conversions and to sell things. Like they're not hawking um, like, oh, this jewelry, like you won't scroll their thing and see like discount codes for different stuff. On occasion, sure, because it's part of the campaign. But for the most part, it's a lot of brand awareness. And they're creating the content, they're putting it on the world. And then unfortunately, as we all know, it is out of our control as to what actually happens with it. Because the social media platform makes some decisions, some celebrity gets involved, there's some other thing happening in the world, there's a national tragedy, there's like a death of the, like, there's so many things that co-op the news and media, which we know all the time. And so I always have that in my mind that I'm like, are they going to be then paid less because it didn't get the same amount of traction that was completely out of their control, but you're paying them for their creative vision, their expertise in the space, you know, creating the content, making it work, doing the photo shoot, like taking it all, the hair and the makeup, the styling, the editing, the creative vision, like thinking of the project, writing it all down. Um, it's, it is hard. Like, I don't have an answer for you, but it is something that I do think about constantly. And I, you know, as I was saying, was talking with a client about it last night was just that I hear very often when I'm having conversations with brands and agencies, especially like DMOs and CVBs. So convention and visitor bureaus and then destination marketing organizations. I can never remember what it stands for, but it's in the travel space, like experiences and hotels and places like that. Um, those are DMOs. 
they seem to operate still with a, what's the impact of this, you know, partnership? What's the media buy value of this partnership in terms of tourism dollars? You know, what's our, what's our reach, not from Instagram eyes, but what is our reach in the market of our brand name out there of people potentially now families, we're trying to get families to come for long weekends. What's the media value buy of that? They're using, I'm going to say antiquated only because it's with metrics that are used before social media, they're now still being used with social media, but I don't necessarily know that they're the exact ones that can be overlaid to our current, you know, in the 2020s existence, which is so constantly changing so quickly, but yet sometimes content has to fit into that box and it doesn't. And sometimes it's messy and it's like, well, expectations are not met and it's really tricky. So I do my best. That's why one of the questions I always ask is like, what are the expectations with this project? It's to better understand that information so that I can either navigate and or educate the brand and agency about how this works. Like sometimes I'm literally talking about how social media works, how Instagram works. Like, no, we cannot make things go, go viral. Like I do not know the formula. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes content that is amazing and what the creator knows about their audience would seem to completely land, but it totally flopped and then vice versa with another piece of content. So it is something I'm thinking about often, but I know there's a lot of dialogue around it, which I do very much appreciate. I do always love to know like what agencies and brands are seeing. Um, I think there's a bit of a disservice with the ease of like everyone having a smartphone with a great camera. Everyone's like, oh, you know, there's, there's a, uh, this industry is totally knocked, right? It's like, oh, you're an influencer. Like it's such a bad word sometimes where I'm like, the, I grew up, I was born, I'm, I'm 43. I was born in 79. Like I grew up in the eighties and nineties. I'm like, Michael Jordan, Gatorade, totally an influencer. Like this has been around for a very long time. Um, this being influencer marketing and brands using people to be a face, right. To, to be another messenger for their brand. And so I do think it's a bit of a disservice with people mocking influencers thinking, Oh, just like take a selfie of this product. Or like, it's so easy to like take a picture and like put on Instagram and then get paid for it. We all know it's very hard work for people that are doing this full-time. It is a lot. It is a legit full-time business. So I think some content creators that are jumping in, seeing what people who've been in the space for a really long time, they don't understand that they've been at it for five, six, seven, eight years, growing their brand, investing in courses, you know, doing what they can for personal development, um, up, up leveling their team, like, you know, bringing on a team, like they have investment in their business. And then someone's like, oh, I'm going to charge $15,000 for an Instagram in feed. You're like, I'm sorry, you have 3k followers. Like that just, that just doesn't work like that. That's, I think what we're seeing a lot of in our group. And I find it very frustrating because like I said, I do think it's doing a big disservice to the people that are doing this full time. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Or, or just those who maybe have more expertise, awareness, perhaps of like what, like how to appropriately value mm -hmm. um, certain things. But I do believe that there are, it is, it's dynamic. It's the word you used before. And I think that's the best word you should, you know, mm -hmm. to describe it um, in terms of pricing. But there is a very clear point in which you're sort of like pricing has gone off the rails. Yes. Um, and <laughs> like, I don't know, I, I support women, especially predominantly female oriented industry in, you know, in trying to get what you can get and like advocating for yourself and like all those things. Um, and so I, I hope <laughs> that in these instances where people are giving like more astronomical quotes that when they get that they all, first of all, that they get feedback from the brand. Yeah. Like I, I hope that they say, you know, that is significantly higher than what I'm seeing other people quote. So we're going to have to pass. Like, don't just say I'm at a pass. Like, do give them that feedback. Mm -hmm. And in an ideal world, I hope those people are maybe new to this and just trying to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And and I hope that they take that feedback in a healthy way. Um, and I hope that perhaps they come back and say, you know, all good. Like, you know, I'm still learning. And I appreciate the feedback and let's keep negotiating. That mm -hmm. is one thing we're talking a lot about negotiating, but like, you know, it's the world of a talent manager for sure is all negotiations in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I hope also that what people take from this conversation is 
whether on the brand side, the agency side, or the manager side, or even the talent side, negotiations are not just, what's your quote? Here's my quote. Let's work together. It shouldn't be that. In fact, if you quote something and they immediately accept it, what that equals to me is that you just didn't quote high enough, right? Like you, right. You, you've effed up <laughs> your, your quote because they shouldn't immediately accept that. There should always be back and forth. Anyways, I want to talk to you a little bit. We'll pivot away a little bit from negotiating because I want to hear like, I love that you're a solopreneur. You've been doing mm-hmm. this for a while. I feel like, you know, we're, I'm looking in the chat right now. I'll even, um, I'll even uh, throw some of them up. Like uh, Tammy. Oh, says, Tammy. Oh, I love you, Tammy. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Here, uh, I'm too nice to tell a manager. Oh, so so like, thank you. <laughs> so like people, you know, really, really respect your work. You definitely have made a lot of connections and and I I hear your name constantly brought up and I think that is doubly triply even more impressive um considering that you're doing this all on your own and I'm a one woman show you are a one woman show as an entrepreneur I love that I want to hear from you what's been your biggest lesson learned as an entrepreneur and in addition to that what would you do differently mm-hmm. if you started over today? So if I started over today, I started 12 years ago, 12 and a half years ago. Um, so I say that for context. Um, what I would have done differently is I would have had a full-time gig paying the bills while I launched this on the side. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I did not set out to be an entrepreneur. It was like not my jam. I just had been traveling a ton. I had been living abroad for a couple of years. I traveled the backpack around the world for a year. I was living in um, Spain for a year. And I was like, okay, I need to make some money. Like I need, I had a lot going out. I'd saved a ton. I'd made really good money. I worked in campaigns and had a ton of money. Um, but I just came to a point where I was like, I need some income. And I was teaching English, but I wanted to just like supplement that. And so that's how I launched my life as an entrepreneur, as a nutrition coach, when I was living in Spain and I would Skype, go to my friend's apartment who had better internet than I did. And I would sit there all Saturday and just like Skype my clients, which are mostly my friends who said yes to me. So thank you. And it was just rough. There's a different thing about it when like you, there's, there's a different desperation when you're like, I need to land this client. I have to make this deal. Like I have to make this work versus it's bonus money. Or like I've got my rent and all my basic means taken care of this is going to be like fun money or play money or like my motivation will be to cover, like pay off my debt. So I'm going to try and, you know, you have different financial milestones every month. Um, That's what I would have done differently. And I remember this thing I heard from Elizabeth Gilbert who wrote Eat, Pray, Love and multiple other books. She committed an hour every morning. She had like four jobs. She wrote Eat, Pray, Love. It was a success. And it wasn't until she optioned the rights for a movie that she, she had four jobs up until then or like three or four jobs. And that's when she finally was like, okay, I think I can quit my jobs. Prior to that, she worked on her art. So it was writing an hour every morning and an hour every night. And she committed herself to that. And she promised herself, she's like, I'm not going to make my art be what has to allow me to survive and pay the bills because she's like, it's a different, excuse me, it's a different relationship to it. It's like, I just write differently. I create differently. Like I think there's just like different added stress. And I, that quote still resonated with me, even though that is not, my current financial situation. Like I've been fully supporting myself for years, but that is what I would have done differently is have some full-time job to allow this to grow and flourish without the desperation of like, I need this to work to pay rent. Cause there were some rough, rough, painful moments as every entrepreneur knows. Um, and what was the other question, Jesse? I totally forgot. Yeah. So I was asking about like, what's your biggest lesson learned and also, you know, what would you do different? Mm-hmm. Those are the two so I feel like you answered both of them. Well, um, I would say yeah. the, other, the other thing I just want to say about lessons learned, um, which has come from being an entrepreneur for so dang long, two things, or no, kind of like, yeah, two things. One, follow the breadcrumbs. Like every good entrepreneur, I've had two pivots in my business. I did not set out to be have a, to have a talent management agency or do this. It very much like built itself. And then I like, got what the universe was trying to tell me. I went from nutrition coaching 
strategy and operations and now to this. It is a journey that doesn't make sense to anybody except for me, but I'm like, oh, I totally get it. And I kept seeing where people would ask, you know, people were asking me to do things and they were paying me. And I just kept saying yes. And then I was like, oh, wait a second, this is really working. What if I leaned into it? And so I would say one of the biggest things is um, follow the breadcrumbs, like just kind of always be aware and like checking in on your business. I'm like, okay, what's working? What's not like, what am I loving? What am I not loving? Like what's coming super easy to me, but like, I hate it. And like, but why do I hate it? Maybe actually I don't really hate it, but I just think that I do. Cause I'm supposed to be doing this other thing. It's okay to change and pivot. So follow the breadcrumbs. And then the other thing is an African proverb, move your feet while you pray. We can all sit here and be like, Ooh, I want this to happen. Or like, I really wish for this to happen. Or like, I'm just going to sit and like, I'm saying, I'm not mocking people who say this, but like, it's just, I'm just going to sit and like manifest it. While you're doing those things or you're thinking those things, take action to move that ball forward. So you want to find more clients instead of going, gosh, I hope people find me. And like, you know, I want to build my roster. Put it on your Instagram bio, put it in your Instagram stories, do clubhouse chats, um, write blog posts about it, reach out to influencers that you like and follow. And you're like, Hey, I'm interested in building my roster. Do you have a chance to talk to me about what you're looking for in a manager? Not even like, can I be your manager or do you have a manager, but just, um, you know, you're super successful. I've been watching you for a while. I'd love to connect with you from your perspective. And like, maybe they are looking, um, you know, you need to put yourself out there. So that's the like moving your feet part. I see that to be true every single time the universe will rise to meet you when you do that. It of course will not look like what you think it'll look like, but those are the two things like follow the breadcrumbs and move your feet while you pray. Mm, follow the breadcrumbs. I love that. I think that's really great. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I find that a lot of talent managers, the assumption for some reason is that like everybody needs to run their talent management business the same. It's like, Oh, well, like what are they doing? Like, if they're charging X percent, I need to charge X percent mm. or if they're doing it. But, you know, what is everyone else doing? And I what I hear from you is that, you know, follow the breadcrumbs because like whatever is working in your business, like mm -hmm. lean into that. Um, and that might just work better in your business because maybe you've sort of compiled a certain type of influencer talent, you know, and and that might look different from other companies. So you know, it's interesting because we were talking about even before we started recording, um, I wanted to to hear from you, you know, how do you run your management company a little bit differently than others? And you're like, I don't know, because I don't necessarily know how other people run their <laughs> companies. And I was like, touche, like, good point. Um, but I actually think that that's a good thing. I, I, I wonder if that's a good thing, because you're just fully leaning into and listening to your business and mm -hmm. your business your mm -hmm. your client needs instead of looking left and right at what other people are doing so i don't know to to that point how how else do you think you perhaps run your your management company a little differently like what do you feel like maybe is feedback that you've gotten that perhaps sets you guys apart oh gosh feedback um i i will say kind of what you were just talking about i think one of the best things i ever did for my business as an entrepreneur didn't matter like what chapter I was in I can't remember what where I how many years in I was but I stopped looking everywhere else for the answers and I was like I'm good at figuring stuff out I like figuring things out like I love new stuff and kind of like oh this this is new I don't I don't know about like when I first when my first client reached out to be a talent manager I'm like I don't even know what that is like what's an influencer it was not that long ago but it influencer was not as ubiquitous as it is now but I was like oh I love learning let me learn this thing when I stopped trying to read, read books, listen to podcasts about like super successful people who are like, these are the six things you need to do for your morning routine. Or like, these are the five questions you need to ask in every negotiation. And I was just like, I kind of cut out that noise. And it was like, all right, Joanna, what is your gut telling you? Like, what's your intuition telling you? You're like, you're smart. You can figure this out. I totally will bet on myself any day of the week. And that was very instrumental for me. Um, which I think is very much why when you asked me that question before, I was like, I don't actually know. Like, I'm just so linearly laser focused on my business and my clients. Not to mention it is, I am like full with work. So I'm like, I don't even have time to like even get caught up in what other people are doing. Um, I do know that I have, a, I don't pitch. Um, I don't pitch in the way that people 
want you to when they're reaching out looking for management and they're earlier in their journey of starting their business. Um, for the clients that I have on my roster and they're like, hey, Joanna, I have this like, I'm doing this new kitchen remodel. Can you reach out to Home Depot and like see about a partnership or like, hey, can you reach out to your contacts at GE and ask about this? Or hey, Joanna, I've got this thing coming up. Do you know anyone? Like, do you have anyone in your Rolodex, so to speak, that um, your Gmail account that could help me with X. I'm like, Oh, sure. Let me look. I actually know someone. Hold on. Okay. What's your idea? And I will happily pitch in that regard. But for influencers that are looking to just constantly have outgoing pitches happen, I do not do that. Like no way, no how that sounds miserable doing that to me all day long. Um, so that is something that I think is different. Um, if you are looking to not do that, I would say look for clients that have so much work, they don't need you to pitch them because they have so much work. That is the case for me. The clients that I do pitch on my roster, it's just kind of like when there's an ebb and a flow of their business. And I'm like, okay, let's like, let's see what we can drum up. Like, let's get some stuff out there or it's Juneteenth coming up. So let me email about the black content creators on my roster. Or it's Hispanic Heritage Month. Let me email about the Latina content creators on my roster. So that's basically kind of the only pitching I do. I am also singularly focused on women of color, women and women of color. So I currently represent eight women, multi-generational, uh, multicultural, different walks of life, all corners of the country, a couple travel, a couple food, two travel, three food, and then three lifestyle. And if it is not a client of mine that I'm recommending, I only I only recommend content creators of color um, very intentionally. And I also if a brand has reached out to a client of mine and I'm like, ooh, there's another client I know that I don't represent that would be a good fit for this, I will always say, hey, are you open to other talent? A, here's my you know, person that may fit this. Or here's a couple other people that I don't represent, but I highly recommend. I'm happy to make intros and I will pass along contact information or Instagram accounts or sometimes make actual email intros. I will also, in ambassador programs, ask, about what's the makeup of the rest of this program? Are my clients going to be the token black person, the token Latina? Who else are you considering? How can we add some diversity to this? Do you need some age diversity? My oldest client's 58, going to be 59. Um, and then my youngest client is in her mid twenties and like on the cusp of Gen Zers. And so I'm always being very proactive in as many emails as I can, specifically using my platform as a talent manager and my connections and network to you know, forward along and pass business to content creators of color. And so how, I mean, look, you know, I feel like there was like a huge awareness <laughs> in terms of, you know, we have to include more diverse voices in our campaigns. Like 2020 was a good start of it. Mm -hmm. um, there were some, start. <laughs> it was exactly, it was a start. That's exactly my question. How do you think things are going currently? Has there been progress? I see a thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a thumbs down. Tell, tell me more. It, we're kind of back to normal in that I don't think there's as, uh, I think there's a lot of lip service. And I understand that there are, you know, to run a campaign and to push for more equitable hires, for push to push for more representation within companies and hiring practices and, you know, at all levels, I get that that is a long, like that pipeline is not something that just happens overnight. I fully understand that. I do think there are companies that are doing it better and I know it takes time, but there are hundred percent things that can be done better from the brand and agency side in terms of looking at the budget and intentionally allocating a certain amount to content creators of color. I don't see that happening. Tell me more. I want to hear more about like what you've either seen work and, and people that are doing it really well or like what people can do better. And I want to hear like as specific as you can get because I want oh, people gosh. to really listen and, and learn from you. So I think, okay, let me, I'm trying to think of some examples. So I, I think if there are content creators of color which I see more because most of my clients are Latina. So I'll just use them as an example. It's like, oh, it's only Latinas because it's a Hispanic Heritage Month campaign or it's black content creators for Juneteenth um, or it's African, uh, you know, it's February, it's African um, American Heritage Awareness Month. I may have totally just butchered that. Um, or it's like AAPI month. So it's like 
Asian creators, and then they're not picked up for the rest of the year, right? Like their campaigns fall off. Um, that has always happened. That continues to happen in that content creators are like, oh my gosh, we love Latinos. Like, please, can you give us a Latina creator? Like, we'd love to partner together. And then they kind of just disappear. I'm like, these content creators are your consumers, are the faces of your consumers and your customers that will help your bottom line. And they're part of the general population. The other thing that I still run into that drives me bonkers is general market and Hispanic market. Hispanic market is run by Hispanics. It is for Hispanic language markets. So it's usually Spanish speaking content or to people who speak Spanish. It is always less budget, always less budget. No reason. The buying power of Latinos is like in the trillions. I don't get it. Um, I'm yelling because it's like something that literally riles me up and triggers me all the time. And it just honestly pisses me off because it's so antiquated and systemic racism that I'm like, there is no reason why you can't just be like merge the budgets and equalize and pay content creators of color the same as you pay other content creators. Um, that's what I see a lot, especially in like the beauty space. It's um, like the Latino market or the Hispanic market and then general market. And it's always like, oh, we got your rates, like, thanks. But like, we're actually working with, like literally they'll say we have um, Hispanic market. Uh, we have a different budget for the Hispanic market. And a lot of times they will tell me that it's like a third, 50% less than general market. Um, that is still happening. That is definitely still happening. I can't say if it ever got like better. Um, it's it's hard. All my content creators are women of color. I've only represented one white woman who is not on my roster anymore. Her business just went in a different direction. So I never ran into it with her um, or, or that much because most of the inquiries were for my content creators of color. So like that's the world I've only ever known is like lesser budgets or them being like the one token person of color on a campaign. Um, I don't know about platforms doing better that agencies use to source talent. I feel like around 2020 when there was this reckoning and brands were like, oh my gosh, okay, we're so sorry. We're going to try and do better. Like, but we just don't know where content creators are. Like they're not in our database or they don't have as good engagement. Like their numbers aren't as good, which to me was like total BS. I'm like, I can give you a laundry list of content creators that have better numbers and better engagement than mine. And you're paying mine. Like you should be paying them as well. I don't know if those databases are better at pulling in different faces and different profiles. Um, I still believe that the people who are running the campaigns often pull in people that look like them because a lot of times they're just like, when I ask like where they found the client, they're like, oh, I just follow them on social. So it's like, if you have someone who's white and just their feed is not diverse, I do believe that they will by nature of just like people that they follow that they may just like see someone and be like, oh, that person would be great in a campaign that we've got coming up or like, I love them or like, I love their content or like, it would be so amazing if I could hire them and they just pull in like their own feed. So, you know, I'm not in people's Instagram, so I don't know how diverse those feeds are, if they've gotten any better, but yeah, I, I feel like we're kind of just back to 2018, 2019. And there's like that little peak when people kind of like cared for a hot minute. Um, that's been my perspective. It sounds a little dismal. I'm always hopeful, perpetually always hopeful and optimistic, but that's just kind of the reality of like what I see happening. Well, I appreciate us having this conversation, right? Because that's, that's a thing. Like it's an awareness thing. It's like just talking about it. And like, hopefully even the people who are listening to this conversation will be able to say like, oh yes, right. Like it, it's a focus. It's a priority thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Especially when you're, when you're changing the status quo, you just get used to what you're used to. Um, yeah. And to be able to make change, it takes both of those things, focus and prioritization. So I appreciate all that. Um, I also think that, you know, let's you like, so yes, I think the database thing is, is a very real thing. Uh, you know, how those tech companies are getting influences into their mm. database, like that's on them. I, yeah. I hope that they are listening to this conversation too, so that they can improve their database and make it more diverse, but we can't rely on that. Right. So right. like, what can we do in the meantime utilize the algorithm, right? So like if you start personally following, you know, some influencers of color, you are going to be shown more of those mm -hmm. same people because you could say like, oh, well, I only know one, this is insane, but like I only know a handful of, you know, Hispanic influencers who happen to have the type of engagement that we're looking for. 
awesome. Do you follow them on Instagram? Right. Because once you do, you'll probably be shown more in, you know, your explore page, or if you're on TikTok, your for you page, these algorithms are real. And so I also think that that's some like real tactical advice to, to give to people in terms of the discovery. But look, even in WIM, we offer you know, get in touch with talent managers like Joanna or some other talent managers who who specifically like focus on people of color. We've we've shared lists around it, mm -hmm. et cetera. So there is only so long where like the excuses even feel oh, yeah. the smallest bit valid, but here we are nonetheless. Um, so we had a, a question. And I just can in. I just say one thing oh, to that point though? Because yeah, I, yeah, I do just want to say I think in some ways, those of us that do have content creators of color to share to help people diversify their um, like campaigns, I know that I have a number of people that reach out to me. I know there's other um, managers in this group that represent creators of color that are tagged and mentioned. Like I appreciate the people that tag me and mention me. And when I see other of those same um, women mentioned, I get, okay, in, in the best of my world, do I want you to have your feed be diverse and the, the databases be diverse? Sure. But next best option, if you're like, I don't know who, but I know who may know who, and you tag me, you tag the other people in here who represent diverse content creators. Um, I very much appreciate it. I'm like, let's keep doing that because it just continues to bring eyeballs and raise the profile that like people are caring about this. People are talking about this. This is something you need to think about. Maybe someone's planning a campaign. They're like, Ooh, gosh, shame on me. I didn't think about that. Let me just like relook, grab some of these names. But I often have people reach out to me and they're like, I know you don't represent any of these kinds of people, but who do you recommend? Because they're like, you always have good recommendations. So that matters a lot to me. I've worked hard to build that trust and both with the agencies and also like the content creators, like pass some good opportunities. So, you know, reach out to resources. Like, don't be ashamed to say, my bad, like my feed just is not working. The database isn't working. Like I need some people. Can you help me? Like there are so many people in this group who can put you in touch with all different types of people that you need, like a plethora of options. So, um, you know, don't be, don't be ashamed to just like acknowledge your help. ignorance and ask. <laughs> ask for help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, whether it's specific people that, you know, now, you know, Joanna, um, or, you know, you're in win, put it in the Slack board, mm -hmm. put it in the Facebook group, whatever it is. I think that's fantastic. Speaking of another great, you know, talent manager who likes focuses on specifically um, people of color. Janae, who's tuning in, oh, hi. Um, <laughs> um, had a question based on um, what we were chatting about at the very beginning of the conversation. Um, and so I wanted to bring it up. So she said, this is great advice. The advice that she was referring to is, you know, the negotiations and the questions mm -hmm. that you had recommended asking um, on the onset of negotiation. She said, but I felt that I've asked too many questions yeah. When I've done that, it, it sort of has killed the deal. Interesting. Do you have any advice for Shanae on that? Yes. Well, hi, Shanae. First of all, thank you for asking that question. Um, that's a great question, right? Because it's so true. And I was actually just talking with a client the other day about like every call, you've got like a certain box or little pouch of negotiating power, right? And every question that you ask. You just like kind of burn through it. And then sometimes you get to the end and either they're tired or you're tired. You're like, oh, I've run out of juice. Like I'm not even at the contract stage and I've already like run out of my negotiating, you know, burned through like, cause there was a lot of questions or maybe there's a lot of lift to get to that point. I would say I try and hop on the phone, especially if it's like something big. I'm always like, hey, do you just have 10 minutes? Like I've got a lot of questions. I will sometimes say like, I'm happy to blow up your inbox, but it might just be quicker if we can hop on the phone and chat for 10 minutes. And then it's a little bit more conversational. And so then they may answer one of my questions without me having to ask it because they're kind of prompted in it because it's more flow and conversation. Um, but if they don't want to ask, you know, answer questions, right? I'm assuming you and I are asking the same sort of questions that are relevant, exclusivity, usage, licensing, like rate, timing, scope of work. Well, if they don't want to answer those questions, then like, we don't want to do that project. So that's my answer. No, I appreciate that. And I will say this too. I I hear you. If they don't want to answer those questions, we don't work on, we want to work on the project. But I will I will slightly disagree or just give another opinion mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Sometimes you just don't have that information yet. And so yeah. I and, and so I do think it's fair to say, you know, 
if you're missing some information, I'm happy to give you a ballpark quote. Just know that once we we will need that information ultimately, and the the price may change. Um, but I I love what you were saying earlier because I feel like this is sort of related to that. It's like it's just like communicate more, communicate more yeah. effectively. What is the way that you can communicate more effectively? We are we are communicating with so many people on a daily basis. Everybody has different communication styles and like, how do we communicate the best with all of these freaking people when so many of them are new, we don't know how they are. So like, there are some tried and true sort of like best practices, like what you were describing, which is like, I love that. Like, you know, I got a lot of questions I could blow up your inbox, but like, we could also hop on a call, which do you prefer? Give them the option to sort of tell you, oh, thank you for giving me the option. I'd rather just hop on a call real quick and talk it out with you. Or I am so booked with meetings and overwhelmed. I would really love it if you could just email me the questions. And both of them are fine. Both of you get to them. Both of them, uh, of those options get you to the same place. But I love that you gave them the option. I think that's brilliant. Um, I also would love to talk a little bit about, I I want our, our listeners to just even like learn a little bit more about you beyond work, because I feel like all of us, uh, beyond work, the things that we do in life sort of just like very much indicate and support why, like our business, why, why Mm -hmm. diverse creators are so important to you. (laughs) Why, you know, being a solopreneur is something that you love. Why, you know, I, I've heard you say, you know, we've talked about like, do you want to grow your business oh, more? And Molly Tracy about, and I talk about this all the time. Yeah. Yes, we've talked about that. So like these, the way that you run your business and the success that you've had, I, I and, and and transparently just like the the fans that you have <laughs> in whim and the advocates that you've Gosh, made, so 100% heart. serious. It's because of like who you are outside of work too. So I, I think this is a good way of getting to the root of that. Mm -hmm. My question being, if you were completely free of like obligations of any relationship, ego, any attachment, what would your day, what would a day in the life of Joanna look like? This is another question I've been thinking about since you sent it over. And it would look like, it would look like my day with, I would be more of a digital nomad. If I did not have attachment to, you know, the finances or like that element, um, I love making things happen. I love being a woman behind the scenes. I worked on political campaigns for eight years and I loved being the person like behind the person who just made it all come together. You know, you have like a big town hall of 600 people for Hillary Clinton. I would just sit in the back and be like, oh, so great. Like my work here is done. Same with talent management. I love bringing the brand and the agency project together. I just love getting stuff done. Like be it helping a friend launch something, has a new idea, organize a dinner party. Um, So there'll be some element of that just constantly happening, happening. In this case, I'm obsessed with my clients. They're dear friends of mine. So like, I would probably keep doing it with them because I love them and it's, it's a ton of fun. I would just be more of a digital nomad, I think, which as I say, there's really nothing stopping me right now other than just actually buying some more plane tickets, um, kind of readjusting coming out of COVID. But yeah, I love, I, I truly love my life. My, my days are great. My life is great. Um, I was saying at the you know very beginning of this that I am a one woman show I am, that is intentional. Every so often, well, not anymore. I used to think, cause everyone's like, don't you want to go bigger? Like, right. There's always this, you run a 10 K. It's like, when are you doing a half marathon? You run a half marathon. It's like, well, when are you doing a marathon? I felt that like, oh my gosh, how am I going to grow my agency? Like, what am I going to grow and bring on, bring on a team member? I don't want to manage people other than like working with my clients. I don't want to have someone else doing the talent management strictly so that I can grow my business. I'd much rather go deep with my clients than go wide which means I am a very strong filter of who I bring on to my business. I'm super particular about who I say yes to because it is my time and my energy. I want to be really excited when I see you calling or, you know, emailing me with a crisis or like just a new project idea. I want to be excited and have the bandwidth to be able to jump in. So I am really particular about managing my time and my energy, which my clients love because I want them to be doing the same thing. I model that for them and they love it because they know like when I'm on, I'm on. And then when I'm off, they're like, okay, she's seeing my email. She's seeing my text. She may not respond, but like, I will go for a bike ride in the middle of the week. I will go skate skiing. I will 
be bopping around, going to different places, like doing whatever I need to do for my own self-care and sanity. Um, you know, the values that I have in my business are values that all of them have. So if I'm like, hey, I need to go to my parents' house, or like my parents are coming this week, they're like, great, have fun. Like, we'll just check in if it's like anything pressing. We know you're on it. They give me that space. Um, so yeah, I think my day would just would be this, but just like in London, maybe meeting up finally with Molly Tracy or like in Arizona, going to hang out with Sammy. Um, yeah, I, I truly love my life. I live in Denver and it's, I have an amazing crew and community of people here. A majority all female entrepreneurs, uh, I guess like attracts like, and yeah, it's just a, I'm, I'm very full, you know, intellectually with work. My heart is full. My cup is full life's great it would yeah it would just be this but like i'd be in london or like tokyo or something well freaking <laughs> awesome that you've already sort of architected this life for yourself that feels so fulfilling i also want you to share the best way for our members to get in touch with you our listeners to get in touch with you because i'm sure they will have follow-up questions mm -hmm. or if nothing else like they're like oh, Jared is cool and I mm. want to get to know her and connect with her. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? The best way is honestly email. You can slide into my DMs, which is just Joanna Voss, J-O-H-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, and then Voss like the water. But it's not mine. I wish it was mine, but it's not mine. I'm not that Voss water. Um, you can slide into my DMs, but honestly, like they just get buried and lost. And then I feel bad. So it's first name at JoannaVoss.com for my email. Feel free to message me. And let me know what your question is or just say hi and tell me that you were listening and like, what was your takeaway? Cause I do, I'm an external processor. So like, I always appreciate doing podcast interviews because I always have interesting, like aha moments from questions that you've asked, you know, like you were asking me, Jesse, like there were definitely some things I've been thinking about and then I uh, just from people listening. So I'm always like, Oh, I didn't think about that perspective or like, you know, Shanae's question. It's like, Oh Yeah. That could kill the deal, but is it killing the deal or is it they just like don't have answers and you haven't made it obvious that like you can give them the information with the information that you have. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good point. So um, yeah, Joanna at JoannaVoss.com. Amazing. And we will drop that in the show notes for sure. And also, of course, you're a member of the community. So people can obviously just like connect with you in our Slack community. That's the best thing. They can always search and find you in our membership directories. So mm -hmm. That's the best. You're getting so many compliments, by the way. Oh, Kristen, Kristen thank you. <laughs> um, Michelle was saying yes. that she loved, you know, bet on yourself. Yes, um, Michelle, bet on yourself. Solid advice. Um, and Kristen also says uh, that she's going to check out your roster. Um, awesome. Because there might be opportunities for her to recommend your clients. Maybe you recommend person. hers. Um, and it's all about just like sticking together. So I love, I love all of this so, so much. I'm super, super grateful um, that you could come on today. Um, I know that our members are definitely going to want to reach out. Our listeners are probably going to want to become members. So they could just be around you more in the community. <laughs> and again, I'm just so grateful that A, you always bring such great like boss energy. You're so real. You're so candid. You. you are so articulate too, which I think is just fantastic so that people, when people listen to this, they're, they're, they get it, you know, um, and you're giving such great advice, but also like you, you definitely like follow the beat of your own drum, <laughs> which I have always respected so much about you. I love and admire that about you. Um, and the last thing, because I honestly could go on and on, I just appreciate how much you give into the community. I've seen so many people like firsthand benefit from what you contribute, what you put out there. And that's like the spirit of whim is all about supporting each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. Um, and so you're one of those people. And, and I firmly believe the more that you put into something like this, it's anything in life, the more you yep. put into it, the more you'll get out of it. And it's, it's very cyclical. So just thank you for being such an incredible member of the community. Um, so sure. Johanna, Johanna's also one of our mentors. Um, so if you're in the group and you want to take advantage of that, um, you can always book a one-on-one -on -one session with her. Um, that's another opportunity. There's so many. Anyways, thank you so much. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with today? You're saying like, oh, it's so great to get a podcast. I, I, I have all these aha moments. 
what were some of your takeaways even from this conversation? I need to buy more plane tickets, clearly, clearly <laughs> that like I'm living my best life, but now it needs to happen in London. I know that to be true. So yes, tickets are not cheap. I have been on a run of speaking at conferences, I think like four or five since March. And most of my tickets were bought before this whole like gas crisis. I recently went to Kansas City for 48 hours for a ridiculous amount of money, like expensive considering it, it was like Europe prices. It was insane. So yeah, my takeaway is that I um, just need to buy some more plane tickets and that, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's great to to be honest. Like my, as I was saying, my, my work and my days are very full. So I have been finding that lately I've just been like kind of popping in and out of whim, mostly to share people that are looking for management that I'm not the right fit for. Um, so it's great to see like just people, Shanae and Kristen and Tammy on this, just like see some familiar faces. It's like, oh yeah, I just, I love our community, how supportive everyone is. Um, and so, you know, just find your people wherever they are, like within this community, you know, you don't need a ton of them, but just having like one or two great connects and resources. Um, I found that with Tammy and Molly and Taylor, the four of us just like have a really great, like just support system happening. Um, sometimes we're just cheerleading each other along. So find your people in this group. It's a really awesome, awesome, amazing group of majority women and a couple dudes. <laughs> it is it's like the dirty little secret yes, we do, yes. we do, you do there but yes find your tribe find the people mm -hmm. that you know you just vibe with I think in life especially isn't it hard to make friends as an adult but like yes it's, it's very it's challenging with kids yes especially if you don't or do have kids right like the, the disparity there can make it really difficult but um how cool it is to be able to have a, a, a group like this or any as I'm, I don't want to like even chew my own tone horn. There's other communities that I'm part of that are incredible to just be able to find like people who are like-minded totally. um, and really hold on to those people. Cause um, I don't know, and invest in those relationships. Anyways. Um, thank you so, so much for joining today. Um, and thank you guys so much for listening and um, we will see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, we got to have you back. Check out our website for more ways to get involved, including all the information you need about joining our collective. You can check out all the information at IamWim.com. Leave us a review, a rating, but the most important thing that we can ask you to do is to share this podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Tune in next week.